Hello and welcome to Splashdown. Today we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the uh, safe return of Apollo astronauts Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swaggart. Uh, and as a little bit of an overview, as most of you know, Apollo 13 was supposed to be the third lunar landing of, of the uh, Apollo missions. And about three quarters of the way out to the moon, there was an explosion in the service module in one of the oxygen uh, containers erupted. And they had to figure out, NASA and all its teams of engineers had to figure out how to get them home safely. Um, you know, the first thing they had to do was they had to leave the command module and go spend the duration of the trip home in the lunar module, which was designed for two men for two days on the lunar surface, and they had to use it for four days with three men. And uh, Don Rethke, uh, who's joined us here today, uh, is a... Um, an engineer from Hamilton Standard who worked on the team that created the life support systems for the <clears throat> module. Um, the next thing they had to do was as they were re-entering or getting ready to re-enter Earth's upper atmosphere, they had to climb back into the command module, fire it back up after it had been shut down for many, many hours, days, and, uh, and they had to do that with very little battery power left. Um, and today we have with us uh, Ed Smith, who is the chief engineer of the Apollo command and service modules during the Apollo era. And then as they got through the upper atmosphere, through that blistering heat of, of re-entry, they had a system of nine parachutes that had to work in perfect sequence in order to safely land them on the water. Um, and today we have with us the chief designer of that parachute system, uh, Mr. Charles Lowry. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today. Again, my name is John Rocco. I am the author of the book, How We Got to the Moon, which is coming out in October from Random House Children's Books, Crown Imprint. And uh, I'm happy to be discussing Apollo and Apollo 13 with you guys today. And so since we went in order of the lunar module, the command module, and the parachute system, why don't we start with you, Don, uh, if you want to tell us a little bit about how you got involved in uh, Apollo and uh, <clears throat> what kind of role you had in, in the engineering that was done for Apollo missions. Good afternoon uh, out here. And of course, on the West Coast, it's 11 o'clock. So good morning, gentlemen. Uh, basically, I'm an old farm kid from Wisconsin. And they had 35 milk cows, so who knows how, where you go in life. But anyway, went to the University of Wisconsin. I'm a good old cheesehead from Packers. And basically, what I, I went, had to go to the Navy. So after I got out of the Navy in 1963, I put out my resume, and I had no clue that we were really going to the moon because I was out in the West Pack all the time. All of a sudden, I'm hired by Hamilton Standard, part of United Technology. At that time, it was United Aircraft. Anyway, in April, about eight, Beginning of April 1963, Hamilton Standard got the contract for the for the light for the spacesuit. We were supposed to make 27 spacesuits uh, for the Apollo event. However, we teamed up with uh, basically teamed up with uh, with uh, International Latex, Dover, Delaware. They used to make bras. Uh, they had stretchy material, and basically, I guess they had the life. They had the soft goods, the spacesuit. And we had the life support system. We married them together for the successful Apollo uh, walks on the moon. Anyway, so that we got the contract for the, so I was a young engineer at that time. Uh, for a while, we worked on propellers. Uh, in fact, I worked on the propeller for the C-130s. And of course, if you ever go in a museum, you'll see this real nice Hamilton standard display on any of the old birds, okay? But how do we get from propellers to a life support system? That's another story, I'll tell you that later. Anyway, so we got the contract then for, from Grumman for the lunar module. So that's, that's, of course, we had four systems in the lunar module. And I'll stop there and I can go on to the next person if you want to talk to uh, about this, the command module and all that stuff. I'll talk about the details of the lunar module a little bit later, okay? Sounds good. Thank you, Don. Ed, do you want to uh, chime in here? Yeah, thank you. The fire is late. I'm not very uh, adept at this machine anymore. Good thing I got daughters who know how to do it. 
Uh, I uh, was actually working in the, in the North American Aviation uh, after school, graduated from UCLA. And uh, we, uh, at that time, we expanded from the LA Aircraft Division to Space Division and Rocketdyne Division and so forth. So we were heavily involved in space as well as the aircraft. Uh, as, at the time, I was working at the B-70 program. And as it was being turned down, guys began to spread out and go back to the other divisions, or to the other divisions. I went, I went to the old Space Division where um, we were, they were just starting up the, what they call the Block 2 Command Service Module, which was the, the uh, docking version, uh, the transfer version. So I, I came on board about a year after that's opened up uh, as, the, as a project engineer on the command or the service module flaw. And then eventually the project engineer, for, the chief project engineer. And after the fire, I became the chief engineer on the, on the program. Uh, I guess that about sums up my background. The Apollo 1 fire. That's the Apollo 1 fire. Yep. <clears throat> OK. And Chuck, you want to chime in about how you got involved with uh, Northrop and Northrop Ventura and Downey? When I was in graduate school in University of Kentucky, I worked at a aeronautical lab we had on campus and there was a parachute company in the same city that wanted to borrow me for two months to uh, do some work for them. And I went over there and I in, in, intended to not stay, but I did. It worked out that I stayed there quite a while and uh, suddenly I became a parachute guy. So North American Aviation hired me to do parachute work for them in Columbus, Ohio. And after about five or six years there, well, while I was there, I actually did some work with the Martin Company on some early work on Apollo. But then our company, our North American Aviation Company, you can see my cap here, we got the prime contract for the uh, Apollo Command Service Module in California. So I was asked to come to California and I, and I did. Uh, a story that goes with that is uh, everybody in that day looked at the Apollo program as some kind of a wild dream, some kind of a lark, like who's gonna really go to the moon? And uh, I committed uh, my life to that. And uh, I was in a church environment uh, one day or one night and a group and there was a leader and he was making a point of some sort and he says now the government's talking about sending people to the moon how many really believe that we're going to go to the moon and i raised my hand and i looked around and nobody else's hand was up and i looked at my wife and even her hand wasn't up but uh we uh i certainly believed we were going to the moon and i uh, sold my house uh, bought another car i packed up Two little boys, a skeptical wife, moved across the country, lived in hotels and rented houses. And I worked on Apollo for 13 years, a grand experience. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into it. That's incredible. That's, I mean, you think about, you know, there was 400,000 of you or more uh, that all came together to work on this project and, and uh, and you all have incredible stories, and I'm so glad you're here to talk about them. So in getting back to Apollo 13, since that's why we're, we're here today, it's exactly now that uh, Apollo 13, 50 years ago, was splashing down in the, in the, in the Pacific <clears throat> Ocean. Um, and it was, it culminated the, you know, the greatest <clears throat> rescue uh, that we can think of uh, when these guys, you know, were so far from Earth without the things that they needed. Now, Don, the, the lunar module, as I said earlier, it was meant for two people for two days. When your team found out about Apollo 13 having the issues that it was having, what was going through the minds of, of you know, everyone over at Hamilton Standard. 
Oh, okay. Well, I'll go and st start a little bit with the fact that we used to, we had a very rudimentary command center at Hamilton Standard. In fact, I, yeah, I, I mentioned that we would have, we, we were given one of the boardrooms. We threw the managers out and this engineers occupied it. We took our slide rules. So every Apollo flight, we were on duty. Uh, we had a port and starboard uh, type of watches. Uh, we knew about the for various systems. And of course, on Apollo 13, we, we got the call. One of my buddies up there in Connecticut, he was on duty at that night. He got the call, Houston, we have a problem. And within an hour and a half at Hamilton Standard, we had all the lights on. We had 200 plus engineers and technicians to help support this program. Because at Hamilton, we had, we had back, we had the qualification units of the lunar module. We had all kinds of lithium hydroxide uh, uh, pe people were involved mm -hmm. in that. We had the technicians. We were, we were running 24 seven, basically tests for the Apollo to help support uh, NASA on that program. Uh, one of our, in my, mm -hmm. my, just to go back to the systems kind of, on board the lunar module, the life support system inside the lunar module basically had four systems. We had the at atmospheric revitalization section, which is a 100 pound life support system bolted to the, to the, uh, to the starboard side of the, of the, uh, of the LEM. Uh, which provided proper air condition, basically air condition, proper temperature, water removal, and all that. And then we had the uh, the oxygen su supply section, and we had 400 400 and some pounds of water on board. So we had the water water management system, and I was the engineer on the on the heat transport section. What it basically was, look at imagine your car. It was a small water pump in the in that uh, in that in that system that basically pumped uh, ethylene glycol, antifreeze, and water through the various components and the electronics of the systems. So that system was working fine. So I was more of a gopher for the rest of the system. But yes, we were worried about, uh, was our hardware robust enough to do the job? Right. Yes, we knew that. However, we also knew that we had, well, along with the robustness, we knew we had enough safety factors on a lot of things. In fact, the little pump, I'll show it here, the little water pump, this is the water pump on the lunar module. <laughs> this pump this pumped about a half a half a gallon a minute of antifreeze through the whole system. Well, this system was tested for 1,000 hours to work fine. The the, the rotor, the four vein pump inside is, is smaller than a dime. I had to certify that this thing would run for a thousand hours. Can you hold it up to the camera a little closer? Okay. Uh, where, uh, there's yeah, the camera right, right about there. It's perfect. Okay. It's uh, inside is a four vein pump. Uh, I'll show it. Okay. Here's the the O-ring is the O-ring and there is the output and by my, my thumb is the in input. Anyway, okay. this thing, what we certified that this ran for a thousand hours. So we knew our hardware was robust. Plus, it's a metal to metal vein. We had to verify that it would work for 100 hours with no antifreeze because antifreeze was the lubricant with water only. So we had all kinds of backups. So my comment was we knew the hardware was robust to do the job. Yeah. And therefore, also we knew that we had run out of logistics. And we'll talk about the lithium hydroxide a little bit later, okay? Okay. We can talk about it whenever you want. Well, we'll, we'll kind of share. Let's, 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 let's go to Ed. Now, Ed, I, I want to ask you, uh, where were you when the Apollo 13 was <clears throat> happening? Uh, and what was your reaction to knowing that they were going to shut it down completely, oh. turn it off, and then try to turn it all back on right before re-entry. Re wow. Uh, actually, I was in the uh, our backup room, or what we call our backup room in uh, Downey. My boss was in uh, Jeff. Uh, D D D uh, my boss was in uh, Houston uh, at the uh, flight center. Uh, we evolved over a couple of years. Previous flights, a pretty good system, I thought, where we had a group of specialists with the specialists at, uh, uh, at uh, Houston who backed up the flight center. And uh, we had our backup rooms like Cam Sandron, uh, which, of course, we had the entire engineering department available, as they did, uh, with all the data and the test labs, et cetera, to back up the capability. At the time the, the incident happened, of course, we were all pretty shocked. But we had a lot of people who had a lot of knowledge. And yes, uh, we never demonstrated, uh, I guess, officially the uh, power down and power up as, as, as did occur. 
but uh, our confidence was pretty high. We had some pretty sound people <coughs> who were well based uh, in the avionics or more, specific, more specifically the, the power system. And uh, I think our biggest concern was uh, uh, ability to communicate all this data in a timely manner and keep it coordinated. Because you know, there's a huge amount of people involved in this at the time. You think of my department, my engineering department alone was like 3,000 guys and all the data involved and, and the capabilities involved along with equivalent people in Houston. And uh, it was, it, to me, my biggest concern was the ability to keep all that coordinated. And fortunately we'd had some, through the earlier flights, we'd had some skill developed and uh, but not to the extent that uh, would take to bring this vehicle home. Mm. Now, you know, of course, reading the book and watching the movie, uh, the Ron Howard's movie, Apollo 13, I, I, always, I always wonder how concerned you guys were uh, when there was such a buildup of condensation everywhere uh, because, you know, they, sh they shut down the heaters and they shut down everything. And, uh, and then, you know, when they got back in there, there was, there was water everywhere from what I understood. Um, was that a concern? I think so. Uh, as I think, of course, you, after all the movies, everything, what my comments mean, but uh, uh, there was concern. Everything was concerned us. We worried and, and uh, we, were, we were interrogated and uh, uh, we had people who had lived this vehicle. We'd been with it through all the tests and, uh, and uh, I think our confidence was very high. Right. I, I, to this day, I never think, thought we wouldn't be bring it off. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, so the last step was making sure those parachutes came out. And uh, Chuck, do you want to talk a little bit about that? And if you could, if you could explain, because a lot of people only see the three main parachutes that come out of the command module when it's about to splash down. But there's a whole system, a nine parachute system that actually works to slow it down because it's, it's by the time the atmosphere slows it down to about 320, 350 miles an hour, then the parachutes actually have to bring it down to closer to, what is it, 21 miles an hour or something like that? Yeah, well, the parachute system is the most visible part of the landing system, but behind the parachute system are the explosive devices we call ordnance. And uh, let me say something about that. That was the bigger concern, bigger than the parachutes, because we had uh, over 200 explosive devices on that uh, spacecraft and, and they all had to work. Well, the systems had to work. Uh, all the separation systems were, were uh, ordnance systems uh, for uh, holding the limb on to the command module, jettisoning it, jettisoning the service module, uh, blowing the forward heat shield off so that the parachutes could come out to the airstream. All that was based on ordnance. Now we had uh, qualified all those systems to high and low alt, uh, temperatures and we had a lot of confidence in them. But of course, when Apollo 13 explosion occurred, the first thought, everybody that knew anything about the, the system said, oh, some ordnance device has gone off and blown, blown something up. And so that, you know, kind of put the heat on me, but it wasn't long until people began to realize, no, that probably was not it. It was, it was down in the service module where we did not have, have any of those kinds of systems. And so, uh, like Ed, I was kind of a support guy from that point on. And, uh, of course we worried about the parachutes because we had not tested them at at really low temperatures. I, uh, the lowest was about uh, uh, zero degrees. And uh, fortunately, the uh, flight directors and the people that uh, in the support rooms, like Ed, uh, came up with a plan to um, go into a barbecue 
method of flying the spacecraft, that means that it slowly rotates so that uh, one side of the, of the spacecraft is pointed at the sun while the other's in the dark, and then it slowly rotates so that one side never stays in the sun or stays in the dark. So it equalizes the temperature around the spacecraft. This was done to uh, also protect the heat shield because if you had extreme temperatures of cold on one side and hot on the other, you might develop cracks that would be bad news when you tried to go through reentry. So the barbecue uh, method of, of flying for all those hours and days uh, kept the temperatures within reason. We did get to the point that uh, when we jettisoned the limb and the service module, we were ready for entry. Uh, I think all the world was was on their, uh, was very alert to what was going on. I think the whole flight brought the whole world together. It's kind of like Apollo 11, the lunar, uh, first lunar landing, where, when the world was really all together. Well, again, mm -hmm. Apollo 13 brought us together too. And so we went through uh, entry. Uh, there were some uh, moments there that, that were touchy because uh, the spacecraft, you, you do mid, um, mid course corrections on the way back from the moon to fire your rocket engines to get lined up perfectly for the reentry into the Earth's atmosphere. And if you're too, too deep or too shallow, that doesn't work. So they kept having to do more mid course corrections in order to get that just right. And nobody quite understood why. So it was a mystery. So it was a great worry. And uh, they were doing the mid-course corrections right on up until the last moments before uh, entry initiation. But once we got that straightened out, everybody felt pretty good about the entry. Uh, the heat shield, of course, was a worry, but not a big one. The parachutes were a little bit of a worry, but, but not a big one. And we came on in and it, uh, and it worked well. Now, the way the parachute system works is you go through entry and your uh, heat shield is, is very, very hot. You know, we're talking thousands of degrees and you keep coming down through the atmosphere and the heat shield then begins to cool and you, the, the command module is slowing down. And when you get down to 25,000 feet, say about five, mile, five miles up, we throw out, uh, we first blow off the forward heat shield, which is a structure that the upper part of the gumdrop shape that protects the parachute. And we got rid of that. That's a big thing. If, if that doesn't work, nobody comes home. And then immediately after that, we fired two drogue chutes. Now these are like 16 foot parachutes, two of them for redundancy. And that stabilizes the command module as it's coming down through 25,000 feet and slows it down further and further and further. And then when we get out about 10,000 feet, just a couple of miles up, we fire three pilot parachutes and they're fired out with mortars like big guns that uh, say four inches in diameter. And they blow these parachutes out into the airstream. These pilot chutes then pull out the three main chutes like what everybody's used to seeing. And uh, on my wall, <laughs> Like that. Is that 11? Um, no, but they were all alike. It was some other flight. I'm, I forgot just which. Okay. Uh, so when the main chutes open, they go through a couple of reef stages and, and then they, uh, they bring the command module down. And once those big red, white, uh, red and white parachutes get open, the whole world let out a big sigh of relief because once they're open, you know you're, you're home. And nothing bad can happen from that point on. So uh, it was quite an ordeal to get through all that. There wasn't that much concern with the parachutes, but yet it was a great relief to see them open. Um, there's a guy that uh, Ed and I work with named Larry Korb that put out a great book and uh, 
it covers Apollo 15, uh, sorry, Apollo 13 and well, every Apollo. And it's his memories of all the uh, problems that we had and how we solved them. And uh, it's a great reference book for Apollo 13. Name is Larry Corb, K-O-R-B. And if anybody wants to dig into that anymore, it's, it's a great source. Uh, one more thing that I might say, if I can brag a little bit about our North American aviation. I was doing some research recently and I found uh, notes that said, when the lunar module requirements, design requirements were being established, and this was later in the program, this was not up front like this command service module. Uh, of course, North American had inputs as to what the requirements would be. And North American insisted that a requirement be established that the lunar module would be designed and the command module would be designed such that the uh, descent engine on the lunar module could propel the command module in some worst, worst, worst case condition. Nobody ever thought we would ever see that. But uh, that requirement came from North American and uh, everybody uh, was certainly glad of that. Hmm. Yeah, I had, read, I had read somewhere that they, they had done sort of a lifeboat practice uh, and they had a procedure for that, but it was mainly if they had to pretty much quarantine off the command module to, to basically purge the atmosphere if something went wrong. Some gas or something got into the command module. They could go into the lunar module if they weren't suited up, seal it off, purge the atmosphere in the command module, and then return. But never, <laughs> never the plan to, to come all the way back from the moon in the lunar module. Does that sound right, Ed? I recently read the uh, book, was it Tom Kelly, the, the limb guy? Uh, Kelly, yes. Kelly. Uh, in his book, he, he po points out that they actually had consumables thighs for a lifeboat mode. And I had never read that before or never knew about it. So between flight directorate and uh, Grumman people, there must have been an agreement to to some degree, have a consumable sizing for a lifeboat mode, which was interesting in itself. So when you're saying consumables, enough water, enough food? Enough well, not enough, but more, okay. more than, the, than their normal land requirements. Gotcha. Wow, that's surprising based on weight restrictions. I'm surprised when I read it. Yeah. So I want to talk about lithium hydroxide for a second. Uh, Don, you pretty much taught me everything I know about lithium hydroxide crystals and <laughs> and canisters. And um, we'll, we'll be glad to add a little bit more to the life support of the lamb for this for this mission. So we would pull out our little smart book. This is our little smart book uh, for the lunar module, and of course we had all the diagrams there. So we had all all the information right here at our fingertip. I call them a smart book or whatever. Anyway, so. We had four systems. Uh, I'll go through these just briefly a little bit, but basically the oxygen system. We knew we had enough oxygen because obviously the lunar module was designed to, op to land on the moon, obviously. And every time you land on the moon, the entire lunar module was the airlock. So you'd have to dump all the oxygen. Five PSI of oxygen went overboard. So since the lunar module did not land on the moon, obviously, we knew from day one that we had enough oxygen. So that was a pretty much a given. And of course the other, uh, the other one was uh, basically in the, in the book, in the, of course, the movie too, they, they went out lunar, the lithium hydroxide. Anyway, we had, in the lunar module we had, uh, in the life support system, we had one big, large, about a 12-inch diameter lithium hydroxide can. And that was good for one day for two astronauts. We had a second one stored behind the rocket, behind the rocket uh, top of the engine inside the lunar module. That was good for the second day. So that was... That was the design. And then, then we had a third one, which is the same size, much smaller, about six inches in diameter, was the same size as the, as the lithium hydroxide CO2 scrubber that was in the backpacks. So we also had four other lithium hydroxide canisters in the lunar module. A total of five small ones, 
and two big ones. So we knew darn well that we, as I said before, we would run out of, run out of the lunar, the uh, lithium hydroxide. And in fact, one of my colleagues, uh, Fred Skribnik was the expert on this. He was running all day long, he was running calculations because obviously also now we, we only had design for two astronauts for the lithium hydroxide. So he was running what we can get out of, uh, out of the lithium hydroxide as far as CO2 removal. Plus the fact that the temperature of the lunar module was cooling down. So he was putting in, in calculations because chemical reactions basically slow down slightly with the, with the colder temperatures. So he was, unfortunately, poor Fred Skinner, he's not with us anymore, but basically he was a, he's a kingpin on doing all the, all the, the uh, calculations with the lithium hydroxide. So the lithium hydroxide, we also, keeping on the story of the lithium hydroxide, the other life support system in the, uh, in the uh, command module was made by Air Research, right? And basically they made their lithium, hyd lithium hydroxide canister square. Well, why was that difference? Well, actually we knew about that before the, uh, the event happened. In fact, the, in NASA, NASA knew about it too a long time ago. And we were too far into the designs of these individual programs that was too late to change this. So uh, obviously that's why in the movie they showed this a fix of putting the, the, uh, lithium, the CO2 laden oxygen through the square ones. All we, what we did is we hooked up to the, to the umbilical cords of the spacesuit, hooked them up to our life support system in the lunar module, we turned on the fan manually, the fan inside of the, the uh, lithium, inside of the uh, air revitalization section and forced the CO2 laden oxygen through the canisters. So that we use that system also to force the, the, the air through that area. <clears throat> Excuse me, now that was, that pre, as you saw in the movie, they, they showed that in the movie quite a bit. Now the other factor that, we, that they did not show in the movie was kind of complicated. We were running out of water. On board the lunar module, Hamilton Standard had three water tanks. Uh, uh, two, were, I think two were in the, uh, in the descent section and one was in the ascent section. And basically, there was a total of about 420 pounds of water, roughly the size of a 55 gallon, 55 uh, drum. And basically, we were starting to run out of water. So what we did at Hamilton Standard, we took all our took all our water components, set them up in a flat plane, so all there would be a neutral gravity for the whole thing. Start running tests, and we were advising we were advising NASA constantly how much water we had left. In fact, the, our system manager basically was considering using urine as a last ditch effort to cool down the water system, to cool, because the cooling system also, to, to, the, we actually cooled the spacecraft by boiling water in space through a sublimator. And the sublimator, what happened is we put, put the water, the consumable water, which is used for hygiene purposes, is used for food preparation, and used to cool the spacecraft. So all that spacecraft heat had to be Take, dumped over water by boiling water in space. So that's done by, and water in space boils at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So we use, we actually use sublimation to cool the water, to cool the spacecraft. I, I want to jump in here just, just because you talked a lot of, about uh, different aspects of both lithium hydroxide and the sublimation. Um, just for the viewers who are watching, and maybe that's going over your head, maybe you know this already, but um, so lithium hydroxide canisters actually held uh, a, a chemical, and it was crystallized chemical, um, called lithium hydroxide. And what this does as the air gets pumped through that contains oxygen and carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide has a chemical reaction with the lithium hydroxide and creates lithium carbonate and water, which becomes like a mush inside the filter. Um, so that chemical reaction happens and it allows the oxygen that, had, that can be rebreathed back, uh, back into the lunar module and in the command module and in the spacesuits. Um, the sublimation is really fascinating to me because uh, when I learned about this, uh, was that creating a, a, a porous metal plate that would allow water to be exposed to space, like a grill almost. On it's a sintered nickel uh, porous plate. Water can, can permeate through it. And it, it freezes, 
And sublimation is when ice turns into a gas, like uh, dry ice, for example. Um, so once that, once that ice is exposed to the vacuum of space, it boils away, as you say, and turns into a gas, carrying the heat away with it. So that's what they would use, and they would run the, the glycol or the antifreeze through a tank that held the water and the ice that was next to the sublimator. Does that sound right? Uh, on, the, on the space suit, we, okay. The glycol is an interchange. We don't have the glycol exposed to that. We have a heat exchanger that, that transfers the heat from one, one of the system to the other system. Right, okay. So the, the heat from the heat transport section, which cools the electronics, basically transfers heat to the water system, which now pushes it into a sublimator and boils it over space. The rule of thumb is on the spacesuit, we have the same process of sublimation. Every time, when you, your body metabolic heat rate in space is roughly a thousand BQs an hour. For every pound of water that you boil away, you will basically uh, emit, reject a thousand BTUs, a thousand twenty-four BTUs. So therefore, if you're going to be in a spacesuit for for eight hours, you need eight pounds of water in the back in your backpack. So basically, that all water also was in the in the lunar module. Also, so we use some of that water too that was in the in the backpacks, but basically, so adding that to two three astronauts. Now you have three astronauts for cooling space, the metabolic loads. Plus you had all the electronic loads. So that's why we use, had to use water and cool water through that. That's why the main reason for using water in space to cool the spacesuit. And, and they cool. and they use they use that sublimation uh, technique for the spacecraft itself. All the electronics were cooled that way. Yes. Uh, the instrument unit on the Saturn V, I believe, also used a, a sublimation. To, or no, it wouldn't have used sublimation because it didn't really go into space. But well, it, it used the cooling plates, I know, well, on the inside of the instrument unit. Well, this, this only works when you're below the triple point of water, which is very, very low vacuum in space. Mm -hmm. So above that point, sublimation does not work. Now you're just throwing away water fat, very fast. Okay. So, uh, so anyway, that's some of the four systems we had on board. And also we knew, why did we have a round scrubber versus uh, air research had a square scrubber? The interesting reason is we felt that a round scrubber was, as the CO2 laden oxygen goes through the, uh, through the canister, you have, radial disp uh, you have radial flow, giving you more use of the lithium hydroxide. The square one, you can put, actually you can put more lithium hydroxide in the corner. So you can actually store more, more lithium hydroxide. Another background, during, during the early days of submarines, if you had too much CO2 in the submarine, they take lithium hydroxide crystals and throw them on the deck and the floor, on the, on the deck, that right. to take away the lithium hydroxide, take away the CO2. So you can't do that in the lunar module. You had to keep it inside of a contained can canister. Right, zero gravity, you'd have that stuff everywhere. And that's, it's a caustic material too. Yeah, okay. And don't they make curtains now? In the submarines that are that are made from, they have some sort of lithium hydroxide. I'm a Navy guy, but I, I was I don't know about that I heard, one. I heard something about that. Somewhere. Especially on the especially on the windows in submarines, they have curtains, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I read somewhere they had. I don't know something like that. Anyway, um, maybe if I ever do a book about submarines, I'll learn that. <laughs> no, well, actually. Inside the lunar, inside the lithium hydroxide canisters, we also had charcoal to take away the odors of the of the astronauts. Mm. So I heard they made curtains out of carbon, activated carbon, so basically in hospitals to take away the uh, take away the hospital smell. Oh, maybe that was it. Okay, that makes sense. Dr. So Fox, I want to be able to open it up to questions uh, from anyone uh, tuning in. If you have questions for these three incredible engineers, um, please shoot them my way and I will try to pass them along. Um, in the meantime, I'd love to do one more round with each of you, um, starting, we'll go with Chuck and then Ed and then back to Don. Um, of, of, you know, your, your general feeling 50 years on now, of being involved in the Apollo program and what it meant to you, because I, I I find I find that to be uh, really interesting. Well, I take uh, great 
great pride in uh, in having worked Apollo. I worked it from the very first to the very last, like 13 years. I worked through every launch and every all through the design. Design was my part mostly in operation and through every mission and uh, and I got to know a lot of uh, giants in the industry. Uh, the program was uh, really a, kind of a benchmark for all the programs, for many, many programs that have come along since. And uh, people in this, in any related business to, to space, they all look to Apollo and, and have looked to Apollo for 50 years for, for uh, how did Apollo do it? And uh, what, what materials did Apollo use? And, and all of those kinds of things. Uh, I work with young young engineers even today, and when they discover that I worked on Apollo, they'll they'll come up to me in in an idle moment and say, "Did you really work on Apollo?" And I stick my chest out and says, "Yeah, I did." And then of course they want to know all about it. It's uh, it's quite a thing. And in these uh, last couple of years, even more so because last year was the uh, 50th anniversary of the lunar landing and there was all the press and media coverage of it and uh, so much talk about it. At the time that we uh, finished up the Apollo program, uh, it was called the, by many as the greatest technical achievement of all mankind. Well, I won't argue whether that was true or not. And a lot of good things have happened since, of course, so maybe it's not true anymore, but it was a big deal. And uh, like we said earlier, it really brought the world together in a certain way. And, and uh, it, it's a story that goes on and on. We're, this year, we're still celebrating 50th anniversaries. Apollo 14 will come up and 15 and 16 and 17. And, and uh, I hope the public does stay attached to, to the Apollo story because it, it's just a great milestone in, in this whole nation. Um, a lot of the old guys are gone, uh, 50 years ago, they were very actively involved and, uh, we three guys here are here on this, uh, webinar have known so many giants and, and people that we respected. And, uh, I just wish those guys could be around on these 50th anniversaries mm. to kind of take pride in, in what they did. We beat the uh, Russians. That was really one of the big purposes of, of Apollo, I should say the Soviet Union. Soviet Union had, had, uh, had beat us at the first satellite, the first animal, the first man, the first woman, the first spacewalk, the first space station, the first moon probe, the first Venus probe. Clear up through 1968, they were beating us Everything we tried to do, they got there first, but we beat them to the moon, and that was the goal. And uh, John F. Kennedy didn't get, live to see it, but uh, so many of us did, and we take pride in it. I have a question from Ronnie for you, Chuck. Uh, she, she wants to know, did you ever get to see a landing, uh, a, you know, witness it in person, uh, to see your shoots in action? Uh, all the manned tests, we're out in the ocean. You had to be on an aircraft carrier. I did not. We mm -hmm. ran hundreds of tests uh, down in the desert on the system. So yeah, I've seen many, many of our parachutes landing uh, simulated command modules, but not manned flights. Right. Okay. Thank you, Ronnie, for that question. Um, and Ed, do you want to talk about uh, your experience with it's hard Looking back at, after 50 years. It's hard to beat Chuck. You know, he's got, he's quite elegant, elegant, uh, eloquent. And, uh, but I really uh, uh, enjoyed every moment of my time in the program. I, I think uh, fundamentally, I look back and I think, you know, what, we, what would the program have been like if, if Chris Kraft hadn't have uh, insisted upon having this backup capability that, uh, he built into the flight directorate, et cetera. Well, you know, you, could, you can't fly this vehicle like an airplane. Uh, the, the, we, need, we needed these, this system, if you will, the backup type um, activities of all the 
team members involved in every flight. And we developed a technique and capability to maximize that capability. You know, what, did, what doesn't show up in many of the stories is that, and Larry Korb's book is a good example. Uh, we spent hours and hours uh, of, of a lot of detail work on every failure that ever occurred on the vehicle, whether it was occurred during um, uh, 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 component test or whatever. We interrogated those failures, understood them, and made sure they didn't occur again. But you, in in um, in space flight, you know, you just can't have a component that fails, and the whole system is dependent upon non-recurring failures. And uh, so, hours and hours of effort that were expended, and a whole system developed. Uh, let's say a, 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 a discipline developed, where the way art is, you know, it's not just design, test, and fly. It's design, test understand failures, correct them, and all that iteration goes into the building of a vehicle like this. Chuck probably is a, is a prime example. He probably had more failures than anybody I remember. Notorious <laughs> for it. It's him and his pyros. But uh, the, 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 this whole system we evolved over the early flights on Apollo, carried through on, um, on to, into certainly the, the shuttle program and, and maybe in, to a greater degree, but we learned a lot. We developed a system that was unique to a capability that uh, probably will never be used before again. I remember when I went back into the aircraft business on B-2, uh, it was quite a shock to find out that the uh, the airplane guys weren't ready to take on all that kind of stuff, but uh, it was uh, it was an interesting uh, revelation to me. But nevertheless, I'm very proud of what we did and what we accomplished, and uh, I certainly uh, uh, enjoyed every moment of the entire uh, effort. And uh, I know all the people. It had a way of involving all engineers. Every engineer, not just engineers, but the you know, whole, whole system, the uh, material people, the manufacturing folks, everybody got involved in deeply into every aspect of the program. And it, it, it's just, as Chuck points out, it just welded a group into a solid group of uh, people that when I know when we went to orbit, our disciplines were so much better. Our, uh, our capability to do the things timely and uh, in a disciplined manner uh, or significant uh, advantage when we built the orbiter. Mm. Thank you. Ed. I have a question here from Robert and uh, I think we covered this, but I'm gonna ask again, I'm gonna ask you, Don. Uh, his question is, is it true that if the problem had occurred during lunar orbit on Apollo 13, um, but before the LEM had separated to descend to the lunar surface, uh, that the LEM engine would not have had enough power or fuel to be able to propel the spacecraft back to Earth? I'm not a rocket scientist, but, <laughs> but basically, I, don't, I, I can't really answer that. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, Ed can answer that one. I'm not sure I can. Uh, I think probably it could be a question. Um, it would have been a different problem. It was marginal. It would well, have been I, imagine, I imagine that, oh, I, yeah, lunar orbit and, and free return are a little bit different. So, it, it had enough fuel to make the burn. To break out of, of lunar orbit, yeah. It's yeah. a good question, Robert. Sorry we can't answer that. Uh, at, at that know. one thought, at that point in time, you got a lot of energy. Would you have enough rocket fuel to physically slow you down or change your course? Because the free return was the was the most efficient way to get back to Earth, even though it took a little bit longer. Right, but once you're in once you're in lunar orbit, though, breaking out of that might have taken a lot more fuel. So yeah. probably not. But then you would you would have had to dump the lunar module, but then of course the, the command module was dead was dead on the flight. So yeah. I don't think that would be a very situation to go. I think they made the right decision. I hope you guys Chuck and uh, and I'd agree with that one. Yeah. 
Okay, Don, did you have any last thoughts on uh, your- A couple of thoughts. You know, again, uh, Chuck and Ed, they said some real good words about the whole program. And I, I can, I can uh, say, have the same, feel, the same feelings about that. And I'll, I'll say I was very proud. Obviously, Apollo 11 was a big, big deal, you know. Apollo, Apollo 11, 12 came along. Oh, that's pretty good. Apollo 13, whole hum. Nobody cared anymore. However, we, we were given the opportunity. Maybe Chuck or Ed can, can verify this, but we were given the opportunity to sign our signatures on a big piece of paper, about 500 of us at Hamilton Standard, signed our signatures. And they were going to microfiche this on a film, on film, and they were going to allow us to be on the take our signatures on Apollo 13 to the, and put them on the moon in the descent lander. So basically, obviously, as you know, we got about a couple hundred miles to the moon and this wave has went around, but our signatures are not on the moon. And of course, also another thing, kind of a, we were, we were awarded by the, the astronaut's mascot was Snoopy. I don't know if you know that guys. Yep. Uh, Schultz was enamored by the astronautic program. He drew up a cartoon of uh, this uh, space uh, Snoopy in a spacesuit. So that was put into an honor of the Silver Snoopy Award. And of course, with helping out on Apollo 13, all of us engineers at Hamilton Standard got a, got a kind of a taste of the Snoopy, Silver Snoopy Award. Mm -hmm. I would assume that maybe a lot of other people in the NASA program got the same kind of award. I don't know if that's true or not. Well, I know uh, my friend Steve Kester, uh, has a Silver Snoopy Award. He's, he might be watching us now. Hello, Steve, down in Florida. Hope you're doing well. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I think there are, uh, that, was a, that was an award given out to uh, a lot of different engineers who did incredible contributions in the program. Schweiger, he's a local astronaut in the New England up here. He came to Hamilton Standard I'm convinced he shook about a thousand hands, glad to be back on Mother Earth, and he presented the awards to us. Another little thought is, just like, uh, just like uh, Chuck when, was saying that he's, I'm trying to carry, I'm trying to pass on my career to some younger kids too. I've been, for the last 25, 26 years, I've been involved in building, helping high school students build robots. And also at the New England Air Museum, uh, up here in, in, uh, in Connecticut, New England Air Museum, we have a collection maybe about 60 some planes on display, including a B-29. And uh, basically also they've allowed us to put an exhibit of the Apollo hardware made in the New England area. So we have an exhibit of spacesuits, of uh, Irwin's Apollo 15 backup suit. We have uh, one of the rocket engines from Pratt Whitney for the upper stage of the Saturn rockets. And so that is now on permanent display. Come on over and kick some tires and we'll, have a, we'll give you a present show by Dr. Flesh. It also includes the Dr. Flesh co toilet that was designed for the space station. But the Russians beat us to that one too. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yes, it, it is. It's quite a museum. I've been there with you, of course. And uh, you also have a life support system there un uncovered so you can see the inner workings. It's an incredible machine. We, have the, back, yeah, we have the backpack on, on, with the cover off it, the complete backpack. <laughs> On the Apollo Days, the portable life support system. We also have the lunar module life support system uh, uh, with it, without its cover, which was a 102 pound uh, system bolted to the bulkhead walls of the command of the lunar module. So that's on display at the museum. That's one of our qualification units, okay? And that again, that's the New England Air Museum in just north of uh, just north of Hartford on 91, go up 91, and you'll find uh, I 91. And just just before you get to the, the Massachusetts border. Okay, that's great. Well, listen, uh, I want to conclude by saying thank you, gentlemen. This has been an honor. To... Yes, Chuck, you want to say something? Yes, I would like for you to introduce yourself and tell us your background. Well, okay. Um, again, my name is John Rocco. Um, for the last 15 years, I've been writing and illustrating children's books. Um, some of you might be familiar with my illustrations on the covers of uh, the Rick Riordan's Percy Jackson and the Olympians books. Um, before that, I was an art director, um, worked at many companies, including Digital Domain, which was a, 
a company that did all the special effects for Apollo 13, for Ron Howard's film, uh, because they did not use any NASA footage in that film. They, they built models and, and used uh, computer graphics and, and did it all in that way. So that was one of my first experiences as an art director uh, working alongside the teams that were that were making those props. Um, and uh, most recently, I've just finished, again, I'll say it, uh, with the help of many of you engineers, uh, this book, How We Got to the Moon, which is coming out in October. And uh, it's an illustrated guide to uh, all the engineering problems and solutions that, that people like these gentlemen here uh, came up with to figure out how we're going to get from here to the moon and back again safely. So thank you for that, Chuck. I, yes. Well, I want to say one more thing. Uh, you have written some 22 children's books. And this last one, I got a chance to look at an advanced copy. It certainly educated me, and I've been in the business for 60-something years, and I found it delightful in your hand, all your artwork, instead of using photos, all your artwork adds, adds such a, a nice touch to it and a warmth to it and a reality to, to the whole, whole story. It's a wonderful book, and I recommend it for everybody. Not just, not just children, but all adults too. Thank you, Chuck. I appreciate that. Um, so, gentlemen, until we talk again, and everyone out there watching, thank you for tuning in. I hope to have many more of these in the future, and uh, I look forward to uh, presenting with other Apollo engineers and people that were involved in the Apollo program. Uh, and have a great day, and good luck with everything that's going on in the world right now. Stay safe. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you.